Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Luke Johnson, and my dear friend Sophie. And today we're going to be doing something that I'm really excited about. I think she's really excited about it. We're going to be discussing, hopefully, the first nine chapters, if we get that far. I have a feeling we're going to get, have a very animated conversation about this. The first nine chapters of Alice Huxley's Brave New World. So, um... I gotta take a second to get caffeinated here and down this espresso shot. Sophie, thank you for joining us. Why did you want to study this book with me? Uh, I really love uh, this kind of books because uh, uh, although it's, it's fiction, it really makes you think. And uh, it makes you think about uh, the possible uh, future and and possible uh, societies, and uh, it, it makes you, uh, uh, I really like to, to think about uh, possible futures because uh, it, it makes you uh, think about uh, in which direction you are going right now, and uh, it, it can make you uh, take uh, decisions in order to uh, in order to avoid uh, maybe some traps uh, in which you could fall uh. definitely it allows us to see to get out of the weeds to see the forest from the trees right to see the grander movements of society and I think that's why these are really important and I have to say the reason why I was so intent on discussing this with Sophie is not only because Sophie is a really brilliant woman and I think she has insights that we can all benefit from, but as any you know, as people who are listening here, so Sophie's not a, a native English speaker. Um, so Sophie is a French woman, <laughs> and um, and I think the reason not only did I want to have um, a non-national have this, to have this conversation with. Because I think you may have a perspective on what's going on in the United States and in the you know this part of the West that us Americans can't necessarily see. And similarly, there's a lot of things politically going on within your country that a lot of Americans have no clue about. To be honest, I have trouble saying your president's name. What is it, Macron? Ma Mac how do you say? How do <laughs> Macron. Macron. So there's um, there's a lot going. You know, we have. Donald, we have the emergence of Donald Trump over here, and this has got a lot of people's bells ringing for a multiplicity of reasons. And it seems like within the French people that this political figure that's come out of you guys is 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 causing a, a, a great deal of uh, I, unease. Would that be the word? Yes, actually, it it depends because uh, um, there are a lot of people who. Uh, who voted for for him and for his uh, the deputies of his movement, and there are a lot. There are still a lot of people who are uh, uh, happy about uh, um, who think he can uh, make positive uh, changes for for this country, and I, I have talked with these people and of. Um, they are um, the people I know. They are they are, uh, uh, they are uh, uh, people who who are not uh, not young people, but uh, they they think because he's young that he will bring uh, uh, novelty and change and dynamism and and this is the the the, um, the image uh, he portrays to these people. And there are also uh, a part of the population uh, who are not happy because uh, they can see uh, that um, they are they are being um, that we are we are being manipulated, and uh, they can see that uh, actually. Uh, his politics is going to be uh, uh, neoliberalism, neoliberalism politic, and that uh, there will be a, 
uh, more inequalities be between poor and rich people and also uh, that um, he's not really uh, honestly uh, uh, deep, uh, wanted to protect the environment but he he's more uh, uh, interested into uh, protecting uh, the interest of uh, multinational companies and uh, investment bankers. Some people think that. And some people are happy because some people think that uh, uh, that uh, some people agree with, uh, with his view. Uh, they think that, for instance, uh, uh, people should work more and uh, they, they don't like uh, the fact that uh, uh, people who are unemployed or are helped uh, or people who are poor are receive uh, financial uh, help and uh, they think that people should, should take care of themselves and should work more. So some people agree with him and some people are worried. Well, right. I, I... You know, there's some very interesting commentary that comes through. Uh, you know, I think it made into the American presses about how he talked out he was going to ru rule like Jupiter. Yes, which yes, is he, always he uh, said that. Uh, actually, he said that. I think it was uh, in comparison to the to our previous president, uh, uh, François Hollande, who uh, who was very uh, uh, close to uh, journalists he he was very uh, he liked to talk to them and he was uh, he was not uh, distant whereas uh, macron uh, wants to control his communication right well needless to say i mean we're not i don't think we're doing an explicitly political broadcast today but i would say the thing that i want to draw out is that there is a great history of parallelism between uh, the Americans and the French. Uh, we had our revolution. You guys had your revolution. They went in slightly different ways, but we ultimately got to similar destinations. Um, and we've been great friends and sometimes uh, estranged bedfellows at times. I mean, we have a gigantic monument from you guys in New York Harbor. Um, so uh, let's let's get into Brave New World. I mean, I, I think the political situation is interesting to think about because I think it gets people sort of thinking about the directions that our society is going. I don't know if... Um, but I think in our private conversations, you and I have talked about how there might be much larger forces at work here than the figureheads of our, of our governments. Now, I think in our private conversations, we have called those forces different things, but, uh, you know, we'll see how that comes out in the conversation. So, um, maybe, do you mind if I reveal a little bit about, like, how I got to the point about why I wanted to uh, talk about this book? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, um, I would have to say, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life is building this tech company. And um, in the process of building that tech company, um, you start to under get a very good understanding of human psychology and how if... Uh, individuals wanted to, it would be actually pretty easy to shape public opinion um, through the expansion and multiplicity of media outlets. And when I started to, started to have that, that, that revelation, I mean, I think everybody sort of intuitively knows that, but when I could actually start to see that in real time, it became a very alarming and frightening possibility for me. And then it made me sort of think, well, how much of what is going on, how much of what we think is the result of conditioning, and where does the conditioning end? And I've been very preoccupied with these questions as a result of digging very deep into books from the 18th and 19th century uh, that sort of warned about this sort of top-down control in the 20th century as well. Um, and uh, then there's, you know, there's just a lot of outpouring of information right now. I mean, you know, a lot of people are turning away from traditional media outlets, and for better or for worse, I know a lot of people are, are really concerned that it's for worse. A lot of people are seeking out alternative forms of journalism or doing the journalism themselves, and the internet has sort of become a free-for-all in terms of printing presses, and a lot of information that has not been covered by the major media is coming out, and a lot of people are trying to make sense of all this information, trying to put the pieces of the puzzles together. And then we mentioned the unusual uh, political situation. And then I got interested in, in Huxley because I, w I found his poetry first, and I believe he's, he, 
he uh, wrote a bunch of poetry before he got into novels. And for the Noetic app and website, I actually uh, found myself gravitating some, towards some of his uh, apocalyptic poetry that he wrote as a young man. And I actually recorded, and you, you know, when the, everything goes public, and maybe even now you can find it, um, I recorded four poems that Huxley did as a young man called The Life Theoretic, Waking, Revelation, and The Defeat of Youth. And then most recently, I found an absolutely brilliant uh, lecture that he gave. I don't know, Sophie, if you watched this. I think I sent it to you. It's yeah. called The Ultimate Revolution. Yeah, The Ultimate Revolution. He gave it at UC Berkeley in 1962, and it's all about um, scientific dictatorship, which is something that I think, um, as this conversation goes on, I think, I don't know if people are aware of it. I'm not, I don't, you know, I'm kind of in my own little world. It's something that we all, in my opinion, need to be um, watching for. Um, it may already be here. So, um, I don't, did you, did you get a chance to watch The Ultimate Revolution? I mean, I thought it was absolutely uh, spine tingling. What did you think about it? I only watched uh, the beginning uh, of the video. I didn't watch the entire uh, interview, uh, but I, I understood what, what he was uh, talking about uh, because uh, and as well, uh, I've I've read about his ideas about these subjects. But uh, did you know he had uh, his own brother, uh, uh, Julian uh, Huxley? Uh, he was I I I've learned today that he was uh, he promoted eugenics and he was the, yes. the head of uh, the UNESCO, uh, which is a. Uh, well, well, Sophie, I, I didn't want to let you know this, but if you start digging, if you start digging into the family of the Huxleys and not only the Huxleys, but the Darwins, um, you will start coming up with some very uncomfortable connections. Mm -hmm. um, but the, these are two families that go uh, pretty far back in uh, London intelligentsia. And we have a lot of um, unsettling ideas. So we are going to, to talk about uh, um, science, <laughs> but uh, uh, what I, one thing I wanted to say, I don't think it's a scientific di dictatorship. I don't think science is the, the real aim. I think science is used as a tool for a di dictatorship. But it's not, as we will see in the book, uh, science can be something else than this. Yes, that's very true. I'm, I, I can't wait till we get to, I'm actually pretty excited to just jump ahead to the end because I, I feel like the most poignant and profound passages happen in the final chapter when they're talking about what is real and not real science. But, um, but we have to lay the foundation for that today. So um, did you want to say anything else about your personal predilections for why you wanted to look at this book before we go into the historical background and the chapters? Um, the, the other reason is, uh, you know, I've, I've read when I was, uh, younger, when I was in uh, high school, I read, uh, 1984 from, uh, um, from George Orwell, but, uh, I didn't read, uh, Brave New World. And, uh, as these two books are often, uh, um, linked, uh, together, um, I really wanted to, to learn about uh, Brave New World and uh, because uh, uh, 1984 uh, is a dictatorship uh, in which uh, they used uh, uh, violence. Uh, it's a more classic dictatorship, whereas uh, uh, Brave New World uh, uh, is more implemented, uh, implementing uh, the concept of uh, voluntary uh, servitude as uh, it is written, uh, there there was uh, an essay written by uh, De La Boétie. If you if you want to read this, he, he it was in the 16th uh, century, but he, and he was very young. He was a teenager when he wrote this, but he he made a very uh, brilliant analysis about uh, uh, how people uh, can be can uh, give up their freedom uh voluntary right the whole idea is to get us to love our slavery right yes 
Yeah. And so I think one of the things we have to, and by the way, I, you know, I hope, I, I don't know if you're interested in this, but I'd like to look at 1984 as well. So uh, I've got a little bit of a dystopian mind lately. So uh, I'll probably be going into uh, 1984, Fahrenheit 451, Animal Farm. Uh, I'd like to go into some of uh, Huxley's other sort of um, lesser known works too, not only The Doors of Perception, but have a feeling I'm going to be in this gear for a while. Uh, so uh, maybe, you, maybe, maybe, maybe not. You'll want to talk, keep talking about these things with me. So um, just to get things going, uh, I, ha I have to confess that I, uh, I used a thrift store copy of uh, Cliff's Notes <laughs> to, uh, to structure our conversation today. So I want to give the proper, um, the proper sharp shout out to uh, Dr. Charles Higgins and Dr. Regina Higgins for putting together uh, a lot of this material that I'm going to be using to um, structure our conversation. So let's just give a little bit of historical background. Um, Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World between the uh, two world wars. He wrote it in 1932. Um, there was peace but unease in Great Britain during this time, and we have to ask ourselves what was causing the unease. There was, there was the Russian Revolution, challenges to British Empire, expansions in technology and communication, challenges to religion, the emergence of a potential one-world socialist state, the grip of materialism, and the rethinking of human sexuality and gender roles. Um, Brave New World reflects the anxiety of losing a simpler kind of life. It, it may occur in the future, but it is very much a work of its time. So Huxley, via his fiction, examines the implications of the change he is witnessing. Apparently, Brave New World grew out of ridicule of H.G. Wells' Men Like Gods, which is probably something I want to take a look at again, because H.G. Wells is so huge for what's going on in America. Um, Huxley thought it too optimistic and deemed his own work a negative utopia, but many of us today will call Brave New World a dystopia. And the novel is structured... It roughly into thirds. There's the establishment of the London dystopia, the Savage Reservation, where the main character of John is introduced, and then John um, coming back to London and, and, and coming face-to-face -face, uh, with this dystopia. So rather than occurring in one dystopia, the book consists of twin settings. The Savage uh, Reservation clarifies the dystopia, however, both scenarios will find that are, are rather horrifying in their own ways. Um, so to begin, and I thought this was really interesting, uh, Brave New World occurs 600 years in the future. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, right now we divide time into B.C. and A.D., before Christ and after death, or B.C. and B.C.E., the, um, with the Common Era. But the way that they divide things is they, they use uh, the Model T, the, uh, the introduction of the... Of, of Ford's automobile, so so they live uh, roughly in like 600 after Ford. And what's very interesting is the all the people in this uh, in this book frequently take the Ford's name in vain. So they're a godless society, pretty much. Um, but they'll be like, "Oh, Ford," or or something to that effect. Like we would say, you know, GD or yeah. you know, take the Lord's name in vain. And in this dystopian future, we've got it controlled by a few world atop of a world state. And the novel opens at the central London Hatchery and Conditioning Center, where the genesis of the population occurs. And the director of Hatcheries and Conditioning is giving a tour of the facility. I may just refer to him as the DHC uh, from, uh, from henceforth. And we're told of the Bakanovsky process, where... One female egg produces 8 to 96 buds that will grow into identical humans. And the conditioning makes people love their social destiny, caste system. And we've got this whole range of individuals that fall somewhere in between the alpha pluses, which are at the very top, to worker drone epsilons. And we get to meet two center workers, um, Henry Foster, a kind of a minor character, and Lenina Crown, who is a pneumatic, a major character. I looked up the word pneumatic. It has something to do with air pressure. I'm not exactly sure what it has to do in, um, in terms of this. So, so that is kind of the... Did I leave anything out very significant from the first chapter that you would like to add, Sophie? No, oh, I think it was the hardest 
chapter to read all this Bokanovsky process. It was so dis disgusting, that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was written in so much detail uh, <laughs> and it, it was hard to read it. <laughs> What are, so can you, I mean, it, it should be obvious to everyone. I kind of blew through it for the sake of establishing the conversation. Why did you find it so disgusting? Can you draw that out a little bit more? Because um, especially how they they uh, produced uh, the lower class uh, individuals of of this society, uh, that they they made they produced human beings uh, in a way so their abilities are not and uh, are not. Uh, Uh, too strong, so they they are going to belong in these lo lower classes, and it's really mis mistreatment of <laughs> of these future people, and uh, and this whole mentality, uh, a productivist mentality, uh, and engineering of births births is really uh, people. Uh, Uh, taking themselves as gods, <laughs> and <laughs> it's really uh, terrifying. <laughs> right, right, because you're having humanity ultimately usurp for artificial util utilitarian ends, right? And then we have this stratification, right? Um, and we have people endowed with different qualities to fulfill different functions within the world state, which means that any individuals that fall outside of the caste system are ultimately going to find themselves at odd with the power system. And part of the reason why I love being friends with you, Sophie, is that I don't think you and I really fit into this world. Yes. <laughs> I feel like I, I feel like if there was if there if there was a uh, a birthing and conditioning center, um, you and I are kindred spirits because something went wrong in the uh, in the decanting process. <laughs> yes. Yes, I agree, and uh, I, that's. <laughs> That's why I really love uh, the part which was describing what uh, Bernard, Bernard Marx's uh, character, what he was feeling, because I could relate to this so much. And, uh, and uh, that's how you feel when you are... It, this book really describes in, in a very deep uh, way how you feel when you are an out an outcast in society. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the interesting question is, is that, you know, something that's very interesting to me um, is that I think a lot of people understand that I entertain a lot of wild ideas. And when, you, when you're an individual that entertains a lot of wild ideas, sometimes people are more willing to confess their own wild ideas. Do you think everyone ultimately at their core feels like they're an outcast in our societies today? And that just some of us are better at obscuring it than others. Like some of us are a little bit better at fitting in. I just think you, you and I are just individuals who, who, like, you know, we're not. We're. I think I don't know. Maybe we're too honest. <laughs> What do you think? Uh, I think. Or do you think? Or do you think? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear the last words you said. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, yeah, I think we're experiencing a little bit of interference, which I'll correct. Thank God we have a backup recording system. But um, what I was trying to say is, do you think everyone feels themselves to be an outsider in, in, in our systems and that just some of us are better at giving the appearance of loving the system than others, but all of us ultimately feel estranged from it? What do you think about that? Uh, no, I wouldn't agree with that. I think some people, uh, for some people, it is more easy to to fit in society, and some people uh, they. Uh, I think the majority of people they they want to fit in and they like to to fit in society, and they tend to be uh, judgmental uh, uh, towards people who are uh, different. And uh, especially uh, when you work uh, with other people, uh, you didn't choose the people you work with, and you realize that um, uh, most people uh, 
have pre preconceived ideas and uh, prejudices and uh, they don't really want to question them because uh, they think that because a majority of people uh, think something is true, that it must be true. And uh, they don't question this. And be, maybe it would be uncomfortable because when you start to question these uh, widespread ideas, uh, you isolate yourself. And for most people, uh, being isolated is one of the worst things they think uh, could happen in their life. Whereas um, someone like me, uh, I don't feel the same because uh, I've always been uh, isolated and I've always been, uh, um, I've, I, I always have difficulty to, to make friends and to, to fit in uh, with the, my peers. So for me, I'm, I'm kind of happy uh, to not to fit in, uh, no, uh, no, right now that I've grown up, I, I, I'm kind of glad that uh, I've been able to, 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 uh, to develop my individuality and my own values and my own uh, opinions. And I think it's a great chance. I think lucky, but most people I, don't I feel think... the same. I think that's a really beautiful thing that you just said. And I'm really glad that you offered that personal testimony because a big thing that we're going to be talking about in this book is how the, um, like everything about this book is being a part of the community, right? A big phrase that gets part of the brainwashing that they all get in the hypnopedia and everything like that is everyone belongs to everyone else. Right. And that, and everything is about efficiency and utility. Um, and because everybody is so afraid to, to draw boundaries for themselves and therefore to isolate themselves, there's no real struggle to become a human being. Mm -hmm. There's no real chance to self-actualize. So everything is just top-down control. And I, I love how you beautifully put that, you know, that I think for, for certain reasons, both you and I have always been on the outside looking in. But I don't think either one of us would trade that, right? It's it can be a tough and lonely path, but like I think it gives us an insight into society and human nature that that we wouldn't otherwise have. Mm. I, I agree with that, and I think it's the most interesting part, uh, in my opinion, of the book. It's the most interesting aspect of of this book. Yeah. It, well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the question is, right, like, do people need to, like, you know, I think the very interesting questions, and we'll get, to, we'll get to this, is, like, you know, how do people separate themselves and, and do it in a responsible way so they don't become, uh, you know, crazy recluses? But then, you know, what is, what is going on within our own societies that's making it so that people are so afraid to become individuated. Do we have some, and we'll see this later, do we have some analog of, of SOMA that prevents uncomfortable thoughts and thinking outside the box, you know? And well, I, have some I have some opinions on that, but let's, let's, let's establish, I wanna stay here in the, in the hatchery in the conditioning center just a little bit longer because a lot of people may be saying, okay, like when I first read this book, um, back when I was in high school, I was like, who cares about all this dystopian stuff? Like, why is this important? It's not like we're seeing any of it manifest in reality today. And whoa, things are getting real weird, real fast. I don't know if people in France are, are waking up to this or know about, about this. Um, but like, I'll just share some, some, some links that individuals can research themselves. Uh, it, 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 uh, the MIT Technological Review has a, has a headline this week. Um, first human embryos are, have been edited in the U.S. Um, through this CRISPR technology. And this CRISPR technology, I guess, ideally is going to try to eliminate diseases like cancer and things like that. But ultimately, this involves altering the human genome. Mm. And, and there's, there's something else from science and technology where they're, 
there it's it's the the shortened heading of it from science and technology talks about the unexpected complications uh, with the CRISPR technology, and um, you know they're finding that these there's all sorts of mutations that are going out of control now. From my evolutionary biologist friend, I'll have to give him a shout out, has told me that that they're they're trying to mitigate a lot of these complications, but we're getting to the point where we might actually have designer children. And if we have designer children, it, it doesn't take too much genius to, con to look into the future and you might start to see a totem pole of human individuals established. Uh. Not only that, yeah, not, I, I, not, not, and I'll just add two more things. Not only that, um, we, we now have artificial wombs. We have lambs being, gr lamb fetuses grown in artificial wombs here in the United States. And you can find that in an article in LA Times. And in Futurism, uh, a recent headline was that a ban on human-animal hybrids has been lifted. So we can see a situation where not only is the human genome edited, where certain individuals might be given an advantage over other individuals, we can see that traditional sex, which is something that doesn't occur in this book, people don't reproduce like we re reproduce today. They actually view human childbirth to be absolutely disgusting. So it doesn't, if they're already growing lamb fetuses in, in uh, Ziploc bags, it doesn't, see, doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that one day maybe all human beings will be born this way. And now we've got chimeras. We've got, we've got the open scientific exploration of, of chimeras. And you could have a situation where um, attributes from other genomes could be blended with human embryos in order to further that stratification and caste system. So Brave New World, as far as I'm concerned, has to be something that every responsible adult reads now as this technology comes out and it comes out fast. Okay, I'll shut up. What do you want to say, Sophie? I wanted to say that uh, it's it's something we could predict because uh, uh, when, well, right, what is happening right now, it's, it's something which is part of the transhumanist uh, movement. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, CEOs of... Um, Companies in the Silicon Valley, they are part of this uh, trans transhumanist movement. And uh, they're, they're actually, it's a kind of religion, if you, if you think about it. it <laughs> it's a kind of mat oh, yeah, mat materialist is. religion. And uh, that's why uh, in Brave New World, it, it was said in a more explicit way. Uh, this way, they... they uh, they talked about Ford, and uh, they they even had uh, some celebration, uh, uh, and it, it was there was a kind of religion uh, in, in this society, and it is it is a materialist religion, and uh, you can see uh, right now uh, it is being. Uh, implement it is uh, the transhumanist movement before uh, um, in the it was uh, eugenics uh, it has and uh, the Nazis uh, uh, um, were uh, promoting uh, eugenics because uh, they wanted to uh, uh, to produce a, a race of uh, su uh, super supermen uh, <laughs> Right, the the Aryan race. The Aryan race, yes. So it's 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 actually it's a, it's a, it's a religion. It is, and you know what? It's not a new religion. No. You know, no. This is this. Look, I you know I read the Bible a lot. I take the Bible very seriously, and that's going to be a subject that we talk about mm -hmm. um, through the course of this. And what what's one of the interesting things is one of the world controllers. Um, has prevented the Bible to be read. It's actually one of the books that he has kept locked up amongst many others, like Shakespeare. Um, but there's a, you know, in the, if we look at the Garden of Eden, right? You know, how does the, how does the serpent tempt Eve and, and, and Adam into eating the apple, right? He says, oh, nothing bad will happen to you. Eat of this apple and you shall be like gods, mm -hmm. right? And when we look at this, 
when we look at this transhumanist movement that you're talking about, I mean, ultimately, what are we talking about? We're talking about fusing ourselves with technology, giving ourselves immortality, and proclaiming ourselves God mm. um, with, without faith, without having any faith in any sort of creator, mm. but total faith in science and technology to give us the exact same things that God was trying to give us in the garden. Yes, I agree with that, yes. I think it's a, it's a, a very... Uh, uh, in, Yes, I think it's a good analysis of uh, of this this uh, this this kind of uh, uh, new uh, ma this material this um, phenomena of people uh, wanted to to, uh, to become like gods because they don't believe uh, these people they don't believe in God anymore they and uh, so when you don't believe in God there is an emptiness and. Uh, they they fill the void uh, with uh, with uh, um, this uh, faith in technology. Right, and I mean this has to go with the what, the theme of individuation and community that we were talking about earlier, right? Like a big part of having a, a a passionate belief in God is to be okay by yourself before God, mm -hmm. right? Yes, like. I mean, that's, that's a big part of being an individual. I mean, now there are probably a lot of people listening to this and be like, well, I can be an individual without God. But I don't know about you, but for me, um, the way that I'm able to extricate myself from the community is to have a relationship with God. Yes. I don't know. If I, did, if I didn't have a relationship with God, maybe I would go back into the community. Ah, I I don't know. What do you think about that? I don't know. I have I think um, I I have been uh, raised in uh, in Christian faith, so uh, I didn't experience uh, 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 being uh, as atheist or not believing in God. So it, all the time when I was alone, I. Um, I think I always had this idea that I was not completely alone. Uh, but I don't know if I, I... I think if I didn't believe in God, I don't think I would be the same person. <laughs> so it's difficult <laughs> to imagine uh, how, how it would be. You'd probably smoke a lot more clove cigarettes, wouldn't you? Yes, I, I don't know. Maybe I... I'm actually um, what I say. I may say maybe um, harsh, but I, maybe I would have commit, committed suicide if I didn't believe in God. Because uh, I think this this world, uh, I, I need to have meaning in my life, and I I, I need things to make sense. Uh, and or maybe what would have made sense to me is. Uh, love between people and no i know that uh, god is love so when there is love between people uh, god is there but even if i didn't know that there there was a god uh, maybe i would this love between people would be would have been a reason uh, to live for me I, I don't think that's a harsh thing to say. I mean, I think I think we have to recognize the severity of the situation that we're in, and I I, I thank you for for share for you sharing your honesty with that. Um. Yeah. So let's uh, let's move on to the the second chapter. Um. Or 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 maybe I'll just I'll just posit this before we move on to the second chapter. Let me just posit this right here. Um, you know, we have individuals in this, in this hatchery situation, um, people have chosen this one world government, this totalitarian state, you know, we'll find out later when we look at the, the world controller Mustafa, Mustafa Mond that, um, this one world state was brought about as a result of some cataclysmic events, but could we see a situation where 
individuals would naturally want to be controlled by an oligarchic few? Hmm. I think so. And uh, yes, I think like I, I uh, talked about uh, the essay which was written by uh, De La, De La and uh, uh, his discourse on voluntary servitude and he explains uh, all of this. And I think uh, some people s uh, say that it happened a lot of, in history and, and maybe some people say that it happened right now in France that um, uh, that uh, people uh, uh, voluntarily um, uh, give up uh, a democracy. People uh, uh, give up uh, their um, their power and uh, left left it in the in the hands of. Uh, of uh, some people uh, and uh, there is this um, they wanted to have a power powerful leader and it is a trend in is in history a lot of people want to have leaders uh, which uh, seems uh, strong and authoritarian and uh, and uh, i think it's a, a weakness of character if you want to have a strong leader and it's the same for for women who like to to have to be in a in a relationship with the with a man which is a macho and i think it's the same problem is it's uh, they they don't like their freedom they 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 prefer to be uh, to be slaves <laughs> so what is you know this is a very interesting thing right i think about this a lot because you guys have there's a, just in terms of what's going on in the global politics of things right now, like you guys have have the EU there, right? Mm -hmm. And you had a you had a you had a presidential candidate. Was it Le Pen? Was Le Pen advocating for some sort of something that was analogous to Brexit? Yeah. Was she trying to get yes. France France out of the European Union? And then you know, in America, we have you know we have the UN, right? We have the UN hosted in in New York. Um, and a lot of a lot of Americans, um, specifically on the right side of the spectrum, are very skeptical of the UN. A lot of people are very concerned that the one world government will come out of the UN or some sort of merger between the UN and the EU. I, and I'll, in full disclosure, I, I'm not a political person. I've I've gone through a lot of um, transformations this year, and I. I, I have no political party, and I don't really have a, a dog in this fight. Um, I tend to think that power can be corrupted, <clears throat> so um, you know I don't I don't like I don't I don't like uh, total anything that looks like totalitarianism. Even if it's a strong dictator, sort of charismatic figure, or something that overtly tries to control life, I'm not trying to make this into a political thing, but. What I'm trying to say here is we do have certain institutions in place that bear some resemblance to these world controllers that are in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Yes, actually, in, in the European Union, there is a problem of, of democracy. And it's the reason why some party of the party of Marine Le Pen, which is an extreme right fascist party, but it, it, it gained popularity because there is a lack of democracy in the European Union. And uh, even um, and the problem is that there is a kind of uh, 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 there is a, uh, um, a there is a pressure on countries to adopt certain politics. Uh, and uh, if the if some country do not want to to uh, apply this politics, they they are they have uh, uh, they are being uh, punished. So I think uh, there is they are the people who suffer the most from globalization and uh, who are unemployed and poor uh, feel angry uh, at the European Union because they can see that uh, that they are. Uh, some a few people 
who uh, want who want to defend their interests and not the interest of of the of the people uh, of the European countries. And s some of this is true, and uh, it's 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 a big problem because uh, uh, their critics are not completely. Uh, 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 illegitimate uh, as are not completely wrong but the the problem is when you vote for someone like Marine Le Pen you also vote for some uh, um, s s their party they 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 have uh, uh, people who who come from uh, um, the extreme right and they are uh, they have racist uh, and uh, uh, homophobes and as, uh, this kind of ideas as as well. Yeah. And the problem. It's very. Yeah. It's. Oh, I was just gonna say it's incredibly hard to get some sort of pure principles in, in in politics. It's like, it's like if you, if if you do feel like someone is speaking some truth on another issue, then it, they come with all this baggage, with all, all this virulent baggage and all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I, I yes, her party is a nationalist party, and she wants to to um, to go back in time in history when countries were separated and were not united. And uh, now, uh, with globalization, um, I think it uh, it would not be possible to to come back like it was before. But uh, maybe uh, there is a need for. A new uh, new form of cooperations between countries, and I think there is a need of cooperations between European countries. But maybe it could be something more democratic than uh, what the European Union is uh, at the present moment. You know, you know, so uh, you know, you and I in our personal conversations, like you know, we just get like little things in the headlines over here from France. But there is a, um, I'm just kind of curious, so other people can check it out. There's this political party that that you that you liked. I hope you don't. I don't want to out you or anything like that. But um, we only heard about Le Pen and and um, Macron over here. We who was it? who who else was in that election? What? Who who else? Who, who what? Who yes. were the other candidates? Oh, there there were uh, I don't know how many, but the 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 oh I, I cannot tell you the number of candidates. Uh, oh, it's okay. I, uh, but I was just if there was one that you, but if there, there was one I that think you wanted. There, there were five uh, uh, main uh, candidates. Uh, so there was Marine Le Pen, which was uh, in the extreme right. There was François Fillon, which uh, was uh, in the right uh, uh, party, the, the the Republicans, and there was Macron, who 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 said he was uh, neither left neither right or both left and right at the same time, and uh, but you know Net Nazis said that this about them, so I don't. <laughs> Maybe it's a bad sign. I don't know. Uh, and there was the socialist candidate uh, Benoît Hamon, but he was a little bit um, um, uh, rebe rebelling against his own party because uh, François Hollande, who was uh, uh, from the socialist party, he think uh, he betrayed some of his values during. Uh, his uh, the time he was president, so Benoît Hamon had a, a new uh, wanted to to do politics differently, and uh, he was more thinking about the future, and uh, he wanted to bring uh, more uh, democracy, and he cared about the uh, ecologic uh, problem and uh, and about uh, the transformation of work. And uh, there was also uh, uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who, who had a very uh, a high score, um, as much as the, the, the uh, François Fillon uh, from the Republican, the Republican Party, whereas Jean-Luc Mélenchon was more uh, 
uh, close to radical uh, left. And uh, he made an alliance with the communists. And uh, uh, so, but he, he, uh, there, there have, he also uh, included some uh, uh, ecologist ideas in, in his program. But he was, uh, like Marine Le Pen, he, he, uh, uh, he, he actually had two plans, but uh, he wanted to reform European Union. And if his uh, A plan didn't work, he wanted to leave the European Union as well. And he also uh, uh, managed to, to win the votes of uh, some peop the people who are poor, unemployed and angry in this country. So both the extreme right and Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who uh, is more uh, um, really the, the left, they, they both uh, had the same kind of people voted for them. That is uh, quite educational. Uh, I don't think a lot of Americans would have known that. But there, there was didn't. also some intellectuals who voted for Jean-Luc Mélenchon. So it was not only uh, populism, but some of them, uh, because they would have, maybe they would have voted for Benoît Hamon, but as uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon uh, was higher in the polls, they voted for him because uh, they wanted someone from the left to win. But uh, so there, there were more moderate people who voted for Jean-Luc Mélenchon. But there, there was also some people who, who are just angry and uh, uh, so, so uh, yes. Well, that is, that's, yeah, like I said, that's very educational uh, from our American perspective. I, I appreciate that. So I have a feeling we're going to, God, we have so much to say about this book. We're probably going to be discussing it for a while, but that's okay because it's a really rich book. So I, let's move on to the second chapter. And in the second chapter, the, uh, the DHC continues the, the tour of the infant hatchery. And he's preaching this social conditioning, this moral education gospel. And he shows us uh, nurses who are showing babies books and flowers and then in a Pavlovian way associated with violence and explosions. So that they, that they hate learning in nature and they do this through a process of, of hypnopedia. And this can be steered to make people more ravenous consumers. And so, it, you know, it obviously raises questions about, you know, do we have something similar going on within our society? And how does it manifest itself? It seems like the elimination of choice seems to increase productivity, but diminish human flourishing. And we have stability, but this type of social programming prevents friendships and other castes and questioning the caste system. So I think it, it's important to think about, like, how this happens within our own societies and if it happens in the same way in France as it does in the United States do you want to go first with this or do you want me to try to take a stab at it yes uh, I think uh, it happens also in uh, in France that uh, for instance people uh, my, my own parents they advised me not to to study literature because they said that uh, there is a lot of unemployment. Uh, when people study uh, literature and a lot of people they they have a master in literature and they can't find a job so they end up uh, uh, being unemployed or having uh, low paid jobs and uh, so uh, people are um, uh, I think there there is a, a pressure uh, on people to to think in a productivist way, so uh, there is pressure to to think that uh, um, you should uh, choose a, a job which uh, which will uh, be which will uh, uh, make uh, in which you will make profits and in which you. Uh, so, as you will make a uh, profit for your company, it will be uh, uh, there is a, a kind of utilitarian and a profit oriented oriented uh, mentality in the way people choose uh, field of studies and jobs. 
And in France, it's more rigid if, even than in, in your country because in France, when you choose a, a field of study, you kind of get stuck in this field all your life. Whereas I think it's uh, in, the, in your country, it's easier to, to do studies in a, in a particular field, but you can work in another thing, field later. Whereas in France, the, the, the field in which you get a diploma is very important to find a job. Yeah, it's almost kind of like um, you have to choose very early on which casts you're going to be in, right? Yes. Like before, maybe even before the, or the age of consent, like you even have yourself figured out and know what you want to do with your life. But I would say, yeah, there's probably a little bit more latitude in America. But there were two things that... Sh yeah, I yeah, just wanted ahead, I'm sorry. to add something, but there is something which happened. A lot of people... Um, General, general, very often when they are 40, but it can happen uh, uh, yes, uh, later or earlier, they, they realize that they didn't, uh, they are not happy with their current career. And there are a lot of engineers who give up their job and become, uh, uh, become uh, farmers. And it happens very often. Uh, in <laughs> How, I, I would like to know, side, sidebar, I would like to know the, the career route of mimes. Do, are, are like a lot of mimes like uh, in France, like former engineers? <laughs> what? Mimes. Mimes. Yeah. I don't know what you call them in France. Uh, we, if we have this stereotype of when we think about uh, street performers in France, we call them mimes in America. My street performance. Oh, I don't know. I don't. I don't. Know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think there are a lot of street street performance, and um, I don't see a lot of them. <laughs> uh, well, I think it'd be really funny if a lot of mimes were former engineers that got disenfranchised with the system. Yes. I, um, yes. It's the thing that people who work in very technical or bureau bu bureaucratic job, they want to do something more manual and more closer to to nature. And it's a trend in 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 a in a moment, in a certain period of their career they want change and they realize they didn't choose the job they like but uh, they they can, they were kind of conditioned to to do these jobs. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I feel it too. You know, um, I'm trying to figure out how to strike the balance between doing so much technology stuff and being in front of the computer, which is totally unnatural, um, and living a more active lifestyle. In fact, I was researching a study out of Ohio State last night, and it found that the, uh, do you, I don't know if you guys know who the Amish are. Do you guys, do you know who the Amish are in, in France? A little bit. <laughs> they're, they're like, um, from what I understand, I think, I think they are a split off of a Protestant denomination known as the Anabaptists, but they completely eschew modern society. They don't have electricity and things of this nature. And they use like 19th century farm implements. And we have, they speak, um, they speak a form of German that we call Pennsylvania Dutch. And they, we have them in a couple states here in America. And what's interesting is their cancer rates are so much lower mm -hmm. than the general population's cancer rates because I mean, the theory goes because um, they are constantly building barns and harvesting, like that their life is completely in harmony with nature. Mm. And I just think to myself, I, I remember as a child how I used to ridicule the Amish. And now I'm just like, man, the Amish had it figured out, <laughs> yes. you know. Uh, and we can say the same thing about the hippies. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. I watched a documentary about uh, there was some hippies in France as well in the 60s. and. And and actually, uh, the doc the documentary the documentary was about uh, ne neo rural rural, and it was people who moved from the city to the country to have a, a life closer, a more s simple life and closer to nature. And this, there there have been several uh, several waves uh, since the sixties of people and. Uh, very often engineers who want, who became farmers and uh, they are having a, a diff and these people uh, often wanted to um, maybe that it was not as radical as the Amish but they 
they, it was a political choice sometimes. They, they wanted to become, uh, to, um, it was a rebellion against consumption society and, uh, right. and they wanted to respect more the environment and to corrupt, they wanted more cooperation between people and less competition. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, I, I think we would call those communes here, here in America. I'm not exactly sure what you would call them there. And there's been a little bit of a resurgence of communes in the United States. I, it oftentimes gets mixed with, it oftentimes gets mixed with heavy drug use. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, intermingling of that lifestyle with uh, heavy psychedelics. Um, which I have some concerns about, you know, and we, we'll probably, we'll, we'll talk about that later. I, um, but, drug free, so put the crack up. That's what I say. But um, you, there, there are there are many individuals have who have decided on an alternative lifestyle that involves that harmony with nature and the you know consumption of of, of drugs. Yes, I think in France, in France, the 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 more the more recent waves of uh, uh, people who who moved to the country, they I don't think they are so much into drugs. I think. They are more ecologists, and they want to to build uh, an alternative uh, uh, economy, uh, which would be more ethical and uh, more respectful of uh, of the environment of and of people. So, and I watched a, a, a video uh, by uh, a, 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 I think it's a so social social. How do you say the, this in English? Uh, Someone who studies sociologist? sociologist, yes, and he said that uh, he used the words uh, co com maybe it was com it's a co uh, coma in French, so maybe it's uh, commune in English, and it, it he said it would be very important for the future. It it would be a very uh, revolutionary concept. Is the fact that people share things, and people. Uh, uh, it's a little bit. Uh, de people decide that some things should not be uh, private things, but should be uh, shared between people. Uh, of course, there is the the common uh, goods like uh, uh, nature, like water, like uh, um, natural uh, natural uh, things which should not be uh, in the market, but. They think they also include, uh, uh, for instance, knowledge and uh, books and uh, music, and they think uh, uh, people uh, should and should share also their means of production and should uh, share knowledge and should uh, culture, culture, for instance, and should uh, uh, build a society in which there is more. Uh, uh, cooperation than competition, and people would uh, help uh, each other, and they think it as a form of resistance against uh, a pri private, uh, private, private uh, um, of putting everything in in the market. And uh, well, I think the thing that we have to be careful about with these commune scenarios mm -hmm. is if. Everything, everything is shared in common. Yes. And one of the things that we would presumably want to mm -hmm. not share in common mm -hmm. would be the family unit. Yes. Because when the family unit starts to break down, um, and this is a, a theme that's explored in Brave mm -hmm. New World, when the family unit breaks down, uh, uh, all hell can break loose on in regards to that. I mean, mm -hmm. everything from just base animal jealousy taking over and there being murderous impulses within that commune population. Mm. I mean, and you might even have a scenario that starts off as a very well-intentioned commune that can end up being something like a cult, mm. right? Yes. Like America, I, I don't know if France has had this issue, but America has had issues with cults. Mm. You know, we had, we had Jonestown, we had, we had the Branch Davidians, we had the, the hale Bop people. So, you know, it's something... It's something that we have to be on guard for. Yes, I think that's the problem. Uh, very often, uh, there, are, there, are, there is uh, intellectuals who have ID to, to make the society better. And there's always someone who is ill-intentioned who will take advantage of, uh, uh, of naive, peop uh, naive or idealistic people and uh, they 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 will build something horrible horrible from from these ideas and uh, yeah. 
there is a it only a, takes it yeah it only takes one charismatic figure mm -hmm. right and it to to really take over a situation like that right um but we digress we kind of i mean and i think it's fine to digress i mean to be honest i mean god i mean there's all these are the things that need to be aired out and open we need not to be afraid to talk about these things you know um there were two things there were two things i wanted to talk about in terms of the conditioning of thought that i think are really important um you know one is the uh at least in american society how the how the bible is viewed um in America, if, you know, what's interesting is I, if people have been following along on the app, um, I, I recently uh, read through the entire King James Version of the Bible, and, and Sophie helped me with that. We read a couple uh, books of the Bible together. And what was very interesting to me is that um, there was a lot of inborn prejudice as I was doing that from people that were around me. They were like, oh my God, Luke has lost his mind because he's reading the Bible. And it, it, and that, and that judgment of me reading the Bible and taking, taking the, the reading of the Bible so seriously didn't necessarily come from people who didn't believe in the Bible. It was very unsettling to self-professed Christians themselves, you know, um, we're kind of we're kind of taught in American society that anyone who takes the Bible seriously has to be some sort of um, bonkers religious fanatic, and that's something that's kind of built into the, the the program of American culture. I don't know if there's anything like this going on in France, but it was I didn't think that I had a, it brought a lot of people together, and I think there were a lot of people that I grew closer with, and we. And I'm, I'm really thankful for that. But I, I, there was some resistance to it that I didn't expect. Do you, do you know anything about what I'm talking about? Have you ever encountered anything like that? Uh, I, think, I think, in my opinion, uh, in the course of history, uh, there has been um, a danger of taking the Bible uh, too uh, uh, literally and... Uh, and it has caused friction between uh, uh, religious people and uh, scientists, for instance, because uh, uh, I think um, when people are uh, being close-minded, uh, they, they, they cannot get closer to, to the truth. And I think... Uh, very often uh, these conflicts uh, are more uh, uh, conflicts of egos uh, or conflicts uh, be between communities uh, and because and due to close mindedness and um, I think the Bible and in my opinion especially the the, the Old Testament, uh, is not something uh, is something which uh, um, it, you should not uh, take take everything uh, literally because it's the history of the Jewish uh, of the Jewish uh, um, community and um, and. And the Genesis, uh, it was written uh, in order to, to teach some. Uh, to, to it was a, a metaphor to to, to teach some uh, some lessons. Uh, uh, but if you really, it it I think um, there have been a, a danger to. Um, people who who pretended that uh, uh, how, how can I explain this I, I, I understand I, I think I understand your, your your point and I think you're being kind to me but I but 
I, I think I understand your point, right? There is this danger that if people take it too literally, that they, it could be a tool for the subversion of knowledge and truth and people that fall outside that tradition, right? Mm. And that this is part of the danger of it. But I, in, in defense of the Bible, um, uh, that I mean, the, the Bible ultimately preaches a gospel of, 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 of unlimited love towards the anonymous neighbor. So the way that I read the Bible is not um, anything that would lead to that. If anything, I think it would lead to the total equality of human beings if we took it seriously. But how we read the Bible, what to read literally, what to read figuratively, I mean, that's a whole other kettle of fish. So mm. we'll talk about that another day. But here, I want to say something even more provocative that I know you're not going to like. Mm -hmm. And it may il il illustrate the point. And I, so you and I have a lot of conversations and I'm trying to like, you know, hint at something. And, you know, I started asking a lot of questions this year that I never asked before. And there are certain questions that we aren't, air quotes, allowed to ask. There is a conditioning that goes on. And I'm not going to get into any of those questions. This isn't the place for it. But... There are a lot of questions that we are not allowed to ask because if we start asking those questions, we will be reduced to a stereotype and ostracized from the community. So if we question any sort of official narrative, be it a political or a scientific one, we are then deemed to be an insane person. Mm -hmm. And that's very problematic because you can see how that can ostracize individuals that actually might be able to offer very much needed social critique but if we reduce them to a stereotype they can't participate in the political conversation and the system marches along now I'm not going to say anything else I think people who are listening to this are smart enough to know what I'm hinting at but what do you think about this the fact that we can't ask certain questions I think in my opinion I think Everyone should be able to ask questions. I think asking questions is a very good thing because uh, it's how sh people should learn. And I think it should be a motivation to learn more. And, and uh, if, you, if you question uh, some of the things uh, you, you learned at school, then you really have to to uh, to do very serious research. Uh, agreed, agreed. And uh, as much as I don't think we should uh, take everything in without questioning, I think questioning, questioning is good. But at the same time, there is a danger that if you start questioning something and you start reading things by uh, people who don't really know what they are talking about, but who only Agreed. want to, to rebel against uh, society and uh, or who want to there are people who want to manipulate you everywhere and on the internet they they are very they are very good things they are good sources of, of information but there are also a lot of uh, very uh, <laughs> low quality uh, information so um, well, that's and that means that we have that means everybody has, but the the thing that we do to overcome that right is that everybody has to be wide awake and use an incredible amount of discernment so they can distinguish truth from falsity, and also we have to be able to have these we have to have these conversations so that the truth can come out. Like we have to be able to have iron sharpen iron, but the more that we marginalize those questions, the truth suffers. Mm -hmm. Yes, but um, I also think we should be aware of our own limitations and how uh, people, uh, uh, the flows of, of uh, human uh, reasoning, because we tend to, uh, uh, there are a con cognitive bias. I, I've, I've talked to you uh, about this. And sometimes uh, some, some things, uh, uh, which are uh, true uh, doesn't seem true to uh, to to us because uh, because it it is not 
it is not um, straightforward. So I agree. I mean, we always have to be on guard for cognitive bias. Yes. And the and I think this and as in the context of Brave New World, we have to ask what cognitive bias is, right? Like that's the thing, right? All these individuals who exist within the the other place, this uh, this 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 dystopian society have a cognitive bias because it has been electrocuted into their sleep cycle. Mm -hmm. So um, the question is, the question I think is, is like, do you, are people like you and me individuals that can escape from the cognitive bias? Are people like Bernard and John because of, of them being caught between worlds or errors in the decanting process? Are these individuals that have escaped the cognitive uh, bias, or do they have? Does do each one of us have a cognitive bias even outside of the larger cognitive bias? I think we all have, but it's not the same one. It would not be the same ones if you are uh, a part of the community and uh, conditioned to to widespread opinions, and if you are more isolated, you won't have the same ones. But that doesn't mean to you 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 don't have any. <laughs> Well, you know, Sophie, something that I enjoy so much about talking to you is that you help me get over my cognitive bias. I like seeing the world through your eyes. <laughs> I, you know, I know you and I don't agree on everything, but at least I, I, I see it from another perspective. So that's, that's, re uh, that's a big reason why I wanted to have this conversation with you. I think what, 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 what we should do is uh, not... Uh, trust too much other people, but not trust too much ourselves as well. And being open-minded and wanting to, to learn more, uh, to, to learn as much as wanted to, yeah, we should be curious. <laughs> yes, I agree. Um, so we've been going for, <laughs> An hour and 17 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't done one chapter. <laughs> oh, I think, I think maybe we got to two. I think we did two. Is it a, maybe we should bring this episode to a close and just... Maybe, maybe this will end up being like a five or six part series rather than two, if that's okay with you. Maybe, but uh, yes, I, have, I will tell you, but I'm not sure I will be... Uh, uh, maybe it... it it will uh, expand in time because I'm not. Sure I will not be uh, there all the time, and uh, I'm also busy with uh, my work. And <laughs> all right, well, we'll 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 figure it out. But I, I think, I mean, I think maybe we've probably done enough for today. Um, but uh, we'll pick we'll pick it up again soon. How about that? Yes, uh, we we will talk about this. <laughs> All right, all right. And I, I okay. had a very right, great time. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a. I think, I think, I think we both care about this book a lot, and a lot of the issues that this book talks about. So, uh, I think it's worth spending some more time on it. So, hey, thanks for listening, everybody, and uh, we'll be back soon. Thanks.